More than leaves. As we noted last week, leaves do serve a, a purpose. They carry out the important process known as photosynthesis, which provides the cleaner air for us to breathe. They also provide shade from the heat of the sun. However, with some trees and other plants, there is more significance than just the leaves. There is the sign of goodness that we look for. And so last week we considered fruitfulness as the sign of a, of a good land. Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 10, the land that God was leading the nation of Israel into and, and also the, the picture of, of good times for uh, God's people. 1 Kings 4, 25 and similarly in Micah 4, 4 and Zechariah 3, 10. But it is also the sign of a, a good tree. In Matthew 21, 18 to 19, Jesus saw a fig tree and he went there to look for fruit, but he found nothing on it but only leaves. Also, in, in Luke 13, 6 through 9, also there, noting the sign of, of a good tree. But as we consider the expectation for us, last week we noted it is the sign of a good life. Uh, Matthew 7, 15 to 20, good fruit or, or bad fruit based on the character of the life. Uh, quality is revealed in the fruit of the life, John 15, 8, and the fruit of the lips, Matthew 12, 33 to 37. It is, uh, also, we noted it is a connection to maintain, as we noted from John 15, 4 through 5, and John 15, 1 through 2. And so receiving nourishment, what is the nourishment from God? What is being produced uh, in our life? Uh, Hebrews 6, 7 uh, through 12. See, thorns and thistles are fruit associated with the salvation in, in Christ. What is being produced? Is it fruit in association with the salvation of Christ? You're more than looking nice, more than providing shade, something beneficial. The, the fruit, you know, that is, the, the fruit is what it is all about in our connection with Christ. It's about branching out also then to serve God's purpose. So, so let's consider this further than this morning. As we consider the, the drawing of attention while maintaining a proper focus on, on our purpose in life, we do need to keep our attitude in check. As the fig tree got the Lord's attention, what marks the attention drawn in association with our life? Not only is it to be more than leaves, it needs to be more about God than just merely a focus on us. We need to keep our attitude in check. Certainly, we don't like being ignored. We don't like going through life unnoticed by others. However, trying to attract all the attention to ourselves is not a good thing either. And so how does our life and its significance blend with the significance of others? In Philippians chapter 2, and verses 3 through 4, there Paul urged or exhorted, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do we have this consideration for one another within the body of Christ, within, within the church? Are we considering others, and, and though we do know our own needs, uh, are we also focusing on the needs of others? Are we striving toward unity among one another? Uh, I, a number of years ago, was given a copy of a, of a little article that was a warning. It said, warning, beware of terrorist groups. In church, we need to be mindful of our, our role. And, and so it stated this latest news reports are that five terrorist cell groups have been operating in many of our churches. They have been identified as been sleeping, been arguing, been fighting, been complaining, and been missing. Their leader, Lucifer, been working, trained these groups to destroy the body of Christ. The plan is to come into the church disguised as Christians and to work within the church to discourage, disrupt, and destroy. However, there have been reports of a sixth group. 
A tiny cell known by the name of Ben Prayan is actually the only effective counterterrorism force in the church. Unlike other terrorist cells, the Ben Prayan group does not blend in with whatever and whoever comes along. Ben Prayan does whatever is needed to uplift and to encourage the body of Christ. We have noticed that the Ben Prayan cell group has different characteristics than the others. They have been watching, been waiting, been fasting, and been longing for their master, Jesus Christ, to return. No church is exempt. However, you can spot them if you've been looking and been going. What is our role? What, what are we doing? Are we, it, oftentimes, if we are more engaged in the work of the Lord, we're going to be less engaged in division amongst each other. We need to stay focused on the task and being unified in the task of the Lord together. And so how do we also live to be seen while still drawing attention to the Lord? In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus urged, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Yes, others may see the works and, and hopefully they do see the works that we are doing, but to the end that God would be glorified, that others would see that God is engaged through our life. So even as Jesus addressed the idea of the significance of our life as, as being light in, in this world, it was to the end that God would be glorified. Consider the example of, of Paul and, and where his focus was as he continued on in ministry. Note how he saw himself as he addressed it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of, un of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As, as Paul engaged in ministry, as he served as a servant of the Lord, his endeavor remained for Christ rather than himself to be proclaimed and, and, and to be noticed. <clears throat> he was the Lord's servant. And so he sought to serve the Lord and for the Lord to be seen in his, his life. And also note who he represented, as he noted in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verses 7 to the first verse of chapter 6. You know, personally, I feel that the chapter break is, is not a good one there. And, and so reading those, those verses, we see, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through, Christ, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusted us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, know what Paul goes on to say, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. For God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. An ambassador, Paul saw himself as an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador speaks on behalf of the one who sent them, represents not self, but the one who sent them. And so the appeal, the appeal is on Christ's behalf because of what Christ accomplished on our behalf. 
Paul approached his ministry as being an ambassador for Christ as the gospel message was entrusted to him. And he was true to the message and true to the one who had sent him. And that message was reconciliation to God that is, is done not by us, but was provided through Christ. And though Paul's life was clearly marked by genuineness of a faithful servant and follower of the Lord, he humbly tried to keep himself from getting in the way of the message. We also know his expression of the heart of his life focus in Galatians 2 and verse 20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, his life was no longer about himself, but it was about Christ. Christ permeated his life, and Paul wanted that to be seen. And that's what Paul urged all to be about. As we read in Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 9, where, where Paul was striving to, to get the, the church there at Rome to, to focus together on things and, and not get caught up in, in matters of, of opinion. But he, he states there, Romans 14, verses 5 through 9, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one, who sir, uh, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. Now note verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die... We die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. You, you see, the message and even his life was not about himself, but was about Christ. And, and, by, and Paul urged his readers also to recognize that whether they lived or whether they died, it was to be unto the Lord. It was to glorify Him. And, and that's what I need to strive toward is that the, whether it's, it's in life or in death, whatever it is that I'm facing, whatever it is I'm going through, that, that it be about the Lord. Do we live always mindful of our connection to Christ in that way? See, in faith, we need to hold to our true identity because that is the means for us to glorify God in our daily life. Peter, right in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verses 12 to 16, and noting particularly verse 16 there, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let no, none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. See, we may bring suffering upon ourselves, but there is suffering that can come upon us and persecution by standing for the name. Are we glorifying God in that name regardless of what it is that we are going through? This is to be our identity. As we identify with Christ, we are to be identified with Christ. He is to be our identity and to be identified with. How are we doing in all of this? In spite of what might be being experienced in our life, are we continuing to seek to glorify God as we wear the name of Christ as a Christian? And are we truly aiming above all to draw the attention of others ultimately toward Christ? You, you see, it is... In faith, as we're holding to our true identity, it is not only the means to glorify God, but it is also the means of drawing attention to 
the names. <clears throat> Paul writing of the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 17. We read, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul, as, as we see here in the language, was addressing their one anotherness together, but also addressing what they did in worship together, and the joining together in their, their singing of, of, of psalms and hymns and, and, and spiritual songs. But yet, what he addresses ultimately goes beyond just even that to our, our life in, in general. Not that we just glorify, draw attention to the name in our worship together as we worship our Lord, as we focus on our Lord uh, and His Lordship over our life. But life as a whole, we are to be mindful of that. As He said, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything to be done with His will in mind. It is living with a desire to not for not only those around us to take note of our actions and words, but also that, that truly the desire of, uh, of the Lord, it is our desire of the Lord to see and, and to hear, to, to be fully aware of our life being lived to his glory and his praise. And though in reality our life is lived out, of, out in full view of the Lord, to speak and to engage in action as if the Lord is near places our life in a position to bring Jesus near to, uh, for others to see. And so therefore, may we grow in keeping self out of the way so that the Lord's presence in our life will be more evident to his glory and praise. And also, in faith, as we hold to our identity, is a means of, of life offered up in worship to God. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Paul wrote, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Is our life being given over daily as a living offering to God. You know, sometimes it is, is easier to die for a cause than to live for a cause. That, that is ongoing, but yet that's what we've been called to do, is to live our life as we resist the world squeezing us into its mold and, and trying to conform us to it. But as we are transformed in life by the Lord, that we are continuing to live our life as a living sacrifice offered up to Him. Again, Remember what Jesus stated about fruitfulness. John 15, 4 through 5, that we noted last week. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Are we remaining attached to the vine? Drawing the spiritual nourishment we need so that we can truly bear much fruit. Let us let life be all about the Lord. Let us bear much fruit for him because we are connected with him. And as he transforms our life more and more into his likeness that that more attention will be drawn not to just to us, 
but to Him. May that be our daily zeal.